Okay, so in this episode, we're going to be talking about notable quotables. Today, we're going to be talking about Peter F. Drucker on leadership. Stay tuned. You are listening to The Leadersmith, Darren Gertis. Now, if you don't know who Peter Drucker is, you've heard a term of leadership or management guru. He is the guru of gurus. He's the guy that gave us the term management in the 20th century. He gave us much of the vocabulary. He wrote 40 books or so, I think 39 books on management and leadership over the course of his life. Uh, he is the go-to guy and the go-to guy for quotations. So if you're looking for quotations um, just because you're curious or because you're trying to write a research paper or trying to write, uh, you know, put together a presentation and you want to slip in a useful quotation, and, and I'm going to give you a number of his quotations, particularly about leadership, and then give you a little commentary on it as well. So here we go. So the first one is this. Uh, effective leadership is not about making speeches or being liked. Leadership is defined by results, not by attributes. And I think that is the one of the fundamental mistakes that people make when they talk about leadership, they, you know, I, I get this all the time when people find out what I do for a living, that I'm a professor that designed a, a master's program in organizational leadership, and I teach leadership courses and management courses. They say, oh, that's, that's really interesting. So what are the qualities of leadership or what are the traits of leadership or something? Okay, so that's assuming that it's de defined by attributes, not by results. Um, it's kind of a wrong-headed way, but that's also how the textbooks kind of position it as well. If you do these things, then it leads to that. So what Drucker's saying is, look, you can tell when somebody's leading by results. Now, that's not always true because sometimes people are just tyrants and they're just grinding their people out. But it, So they get the bottom line results, but they're not getting results in terms of growth and helping people uh, succeed and develop and that kind of thing. We also have this false idea um, that <laughs> making speeches, he talks about it. Effective leadership is not about making speeches. So when you when you watch a movie like, say, Braveheart, uh, we get this idea that it's all about, you know, he just made this uh, brilliant speech and now the people rally to him. Well, no, it's probably more that he was in the trenches with them than that he made a brilliant speech. Uh, that, because leadership is far more about a process than it is about making a speech. But Hollywood lies to us about all kinds of things, so discount whatever you see in the movies. Okay, next one. Effective people are not problem-minded. They're opportunity-minded. They feed opportunities and starve problems. They think preventively. Okay, so what he's saying here is very similar to what Colin said when in, in Good to Great he talks about how you put your best people on your best opportunities, not on your biggest problems. Yeah, be opportunity-minded. See where you can grow things instead of spending time trying to put out fires or worry about problems. Focus on opportunities. Okay, the next one. Your first and foremost job as a leader is to take charge of your own energy and then to help orchestrate the energy of those around you. So that's a great line because um, D. Hawk of Visa said that the, uh, the lion's share of your energy as a leader sh should be on self-leadership. I think he said 50% of leadership is self-leadership. So if you can get yourself to do the things that you need to be doing, you're halfway there. Because then by personal example, then by uh, showing people the way yourself, you're actually leading just by self-leadership. So your foremost job is to take charge of your own energy. Then it is to help marshal those around you. And remember, leadership is not about personal achievement. Leadership is about helping others around you to do their work and get obstacles out of their way and equip them so that they can do work. Leadership is about working through others. Okay, next one. The leaders who work most effectively, it seems to me, never say I. And that's not because they have trained themselves not to say I. They don't think I. They think we. They think team. They understand their job to be to make the team function. They accept responsibility and don't sidestep it. But we gets the credit. This is what creates trust, what enables you to get the task done. Okay, the difference between thinking I and we is fairly common in the literature, and he's absolutely right about this. So if you you can listen to a leader, and as they talk, if they say I, 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 all the time, if they're always talking about, well, I did this, and I did that, and I did this, and whatever, 
that's a red flag. If you hear them say we are this and we're doing that and we have done this and the team has done that, right? That's a very good sign, but it's not enough because they could have trained themselves to talk in terms of we, even if they really mean I. But if they do that, that's a positive sign moving the right direction. The reason that this is important is because the mentality behind it. So if your mentality truly is a we rather than I, you'll do a lot of things right just by default, just trying to incorporate others. Like, let's, let's think about this. So let's think about planning. If you have an I mentality, you sit around in your office and, and brew on uh, what it is that needs to change, how, how you're going to change it, what it would be optimally like. If you have a we mentality, you take that same need for change and you start talking to others and saying, hey, how would you do this? How would you do that? And then you start to meet with them and gather them and kick the ideas around and really work. There's a, it's just you're taking two very different paths if you think we as opposed to thinking I. So this is really important to leadership success. Okay, next, no institution can possibly survive if it needs geniuses or supermen to manage it. It must be organized in such a way as to be able to get along under a leadership composed of average human beings. I, I really like that quote because it, sometimes we think that, uh, oh, if we just had great leaders. No, you, you, you don't need great leaders. You need about average leaders who are all pulling the right direction. They're not across purposes. And if you have them, if you have average leaders well organized and there's leadership rippling through the organization, like trickling down, not just one leader at the top telling everybody what to do, but if you have everybody engaged in leadership at every level throughout the organization, you're going to do just fine because they're going to be taking care of what they need to be taken care of. So it's not that you need a super leader. It's that you, the only thing that you need of a super leader, let me put it like this, is somebody at the top who is allowing the rest of the organization to apply leadership. If What happens very often is not that you need a super leader. It's that you have a petty tyrant at the top of the organization who is stifling leadership throughout the rest of the organization because it has to be all about that person. And when that happens, he becomes a bottleneck and the, the organization like an engine starts to sputter and stall. If you do not have that, if you just have an average guy doing his thing, you'll be fine. If you have a great one, you'll be fine. It, that, what you need is to light up the leadership throughout the organization, not focus about the one great leader at the top. Okay, I really, really, really love this quote, and I've used it in class, I don't know, too many times to count, because somehow we have this idea that um, great leaders are just the best decision makers. That's not it. Listen to this. Every decision is like a surgery. It is an intervention into a system, and therefore it carries the risk of shock. One does not make unnecessary decisions any more than a good surgeon does unnecessary surgery. Now that resonates with me because I have worked for leaders who thought that it was their job to make the decisions of people three or four layers down the organization. Um, George W. Bush called himself the decider in chief. Now he had an MBA, so he should have known better, but he thought like, well, my job is just to make great decisions. It kind of, I mean, that's part of it. But when you are at the top, if you're just thinking that you have to make all the decisions, no, no, no. Here's the way it works. The guy that's doing the job, that, that person has to be responsible for his unit, right? And he has to be making the decisions. If you're above him making those decisions, then you're invading his sphere. You're enfeebling him. You're uh, enabling dependence on him. Don't, don't do that. Let him make those decisions. Think If you think about you making a decision like un, like an unnecessary surgery, you'll back off and let him do the thing. Now, you have to keep make sure he's on task and that kind of thing. That's I'm, I'm not arguing that you just let him go all wild west, but your intervention should be a last uh, decision. It should not be something that you do regularly. Every decision is like a surgery, and that's just, it's so profound, especially if you have lived in an organization where the, you know, from the top, everything is decrees from the top, that, that uh, quote will re really resonate with you. Okay, next, accept the fact that we have to treat almost everyone as a volunteer. <laughs> I, I just, I love that quote, accept the fact that we have to treat almost anybody 
as a volunteer. And so when you're when you're reading that, when you're thinking through that quote, it, it makes sense, right? I mean, if I follow you because my paycheck depends on it, that's not necessarily leadership and followership. If I follow you because I want to, like, think about this. If I go to Habitat for Humanity or, or some volunteer organization, and if I show up and you're a good leader, that's great. If I come back the next day or next week or whenever I'm supposed to, again, you have now demonstrated proof of concept that you are leading well. It's if I don't show up, well, you don't necessarily know. If we treat people like volunteers, if we if we think about them that way, rather than uh, how we're they're dependent on us, we'll get a better sense of whether we're really leading or not. Now that kind of leads to the next one. Rank does not confer privilege or give power. It imposes responsibility. So as leaders, we think about, you know, it's good to be king or, you know, rank has its privileges. Yeah, rank it does allow you to do things that maybe you can't do lower in the organization. But don't think about it like that. It doesn't confer privilege or give power. It imposes a responsibility. If you think in terms of the higher you go, the more responsible you are, the more it is your duty to ensure the well-being and benefit of those in the organization, you'll, again, it's, it, it's, you'll make mental different decisions on the path, right? You'll, you'll turn left instead of right or right instead of left at the appropriate times because you're thinking through it properly. You're trying to see how do I help these people succeed rather than, hey, they should be listening to me or why aren't they doing my bidding or, or whatever kind of stupid stuff that you've convinced yourself of because you're in charge. If you feel that deep responsibility of leadership, you will act differently and people will respond differently in accordance with that. Okay, next, leaders shouldn't attach moral significance to their ideas. Do that and you can't compromise. So I, I see this uh, happen with a couple categories of people, uh, ministers and educators and the those in righteous movements, like you know an environmentalist who's going to save the world and if you don't listen to him, you're evil, right? Okay, so ministers are kind of like this, right? Because they confuse... Um, uh, they confuse like the thou shalt nots and absolutes of the scripture sometimes, not always, but sometimes with whatever came into their head. That's attaching moral significance to their idea. And if you cross that idea, then you're wrong. Educators do this in a different way. They got a PhD and now they think that they know stuff about things outside of their field and they can be just as obstinate. Like I know a lot about things within my PhD. I don't know anything about what's under the hood of my car. Like I, I kind of know that's an engine but I don't know much about it. But if I if I carry the same arrogance or not arrogance attitude about how much I know about PhD stuff into my, what's under my car, uh, I'm not going to be able to listen. It's that kind of thing. Okay, so hopefully that helps you understand. So here's the quote again: Leaders shouldn't attach moral significance to their ideas. Do that, and you can't compromise. So if I have to be right because it came out of my head, I can't compromise. I can't listen to your idea and. Here, honestly, I've always found that when I take my idea to other people, people that maybe only have a bachelor's degree, not even a bachelor's degree, and I say, well, what do you think? They always improve my idea. It's amazing how often that happens. Every time I bring, so here's here's my best draft. What do you think? Other people, you know, it's a multitude of counselors where victory is secure, according to the Proverbs. That's that's where you're safe. And so bring it to other people. But if I have to, if, if I'm beholden to my own idea, if I think that, well, it's if this is my idea, if of course it's the best, then I can't change. And I need to change in order to improve. So don't attach moral significance to your own ideas. Otherwise, you can't compromise. Okay, next one. Successful leaders don't start out asking, what do I want to do? They ask, what needs to be done? Then they ask, of those things that would make a difference, which are right for me? So what it's saying is, I don't just try to go do what I want to do. I go figure out what what has to be done and in what order. And then of those things, which are the things that I should do and which are the things that other people within the organization should do? That's pretty straightforward, but a lot of people make a mistake here where they just start thinking, okay, I'm going to just start ticking off these things and doing things that you know fit me best or whatever. Mm, no, figure out in that sequence what needs to be done, 
And then of those things, should I do this or should somebody else do that? And making that decision is going to be important. Okay, next, no executive has ever suffered because his subordinates were strong and effective. Gosh, I like that quote. That is such a great quote. No executive has ever suffered because his subordinates were strong and effective. Sometimes uh, leaders, because of maybe low self-esteem or jealousy or uh, fear that their people are going to leave, stifle their subordinates. I've seen this happen. And when they do that, they they... I guess they feel more secure, but they're actually less secure. They're they're less strong than they otherwise would be because their subordinates are are making them strong, and that, then they take credit for their subordinates' uh, activities. Say, you know, well, you know, I really think that uh, I'm glad that I came up with this idea when it's really Sally or Susie's job, or or she came up with that, and you're stealing the idea, and then now she's angry with you. Uh, we know that you didn't do it. The whole department knows that you stole. Uh, and, and it just becomes a mess. Why not instead just simply reflect, you know, she did this great work. I am so proud of her. I, you know, I give her all the credit that makes you look magnanimous and that makes you look like you're smart enough to hire her. So you get credit by giving her credit. You get indirect credit by giving her the credit for her job, what she did. So again, no executive has ever suffered because his subordinates were strong and effective. I, I can't say that quote enough. Okay, next. Success, odd as it seems, you will achieve the greatest results in business and career if you drop the word achievement from your vocabulary and replace it with contribution. Okay, what do we mean by that? So Again, leadership is not about your personal achievement. It is about getting work done through others. Now, if you, even if you're just looking at it as an individual, achievement is like, what can I do? Here's what I can show that I've done. But contribution is what have I given? How have I blessed you? How have I made this better? This episode is not an achievement. It is a contribution because the whole purpose of what we're doing here, why you're listening to this now and why I'm talking now is that I'm hoping to make a contribution to your success. I'm hoping that there's something in this episode that will resonate with you, that will help you be a better leader, or that will help you in your paper, your project, your presentation, whatever. I'm trying to contribute. I'm not trying to achieve. Ha ha, look at me. I'm the best. It's not that. It's about serving you. And if you don't have that mindset, then it becomes all about you. So this is a great quote for that reason. Okay, this is the last one in the series for today. And it's it's awesome. I mean, it's just, it's an awesome quote. Okay, Drucker says this, an employer has no business with a man's personality. Employment is a specific contract calling for specific performance and nothing else. Any attempt of an employer to go beyond this is usurpation. It is immoral as well as illegal intrusion of privacy. It is an abuse of power. An employee owes no loyalty. He owes no love and no attitudes. He owes performance and nothing else. Now, I know leaders who are so insecure that they demand personal loyalty, even if they're out of sync or out of step with the organizational mission. I had a student, an MBA student, who told me about his boss that demanded that he like him. Like, no, but as long as you work for me, you better like me. Well, I, if you have to say that, something went wrong somewhere, right? But you as an employee, what, what did you sign up for? Did you sign up to love your employer, to have an attitude of, you know, what I don't understand. You don't owe your employer loyalty, love, or attitude. What you do owe is performance, getting the job done. Now, it sounds weird to say that, but that is the reality. Now, if you're a good leader, you will naturally attract loyalty. You will naturally attract love. You will naturally attract a positive attitude. But don't confuse what your employee owes you with what is the fruit of good leadership. So if you're not seeing loyalty, love, and a positive attitude, guess what? That's a sign that you need to check your leadership. Okay? So again, let me read the quote one more time and we'll end with this. An employer has no business with a man's personality. Employment is a specific contract calling for specific performance and nothing else. 
any attempt of an employer to go beyond this is usurpation. It is immoral as well as illegal intrusion of privacy. It's abuse of power. An employee owes no loyalty. He owes no love and no attitudes. He owes performance and nothing else. And that's from his 1973 classic tome on management. Okay, so, oh, you know, I said I, that was going to be the last one, but I, I want to do one more if you'll just uh, allow me to. And this this is great because, you know, sometimes we ask, uh, are leaders born or are they made? And, you know, we have this classic uh, conundrum and, you know, you, you've heard the term like a natural born leader. And there are some people that just seem more suited to the role. And then we have the other side that says, no, they're made. And Drucker answers it differently. Uh, when he was asked, are leaders born or made? He says, leaders grow. They are not made. Now, why is it important to say grow? Because growth is organic. It's a process. It is something that you start from a seed and you keep growing and growing and growing. And same with you. Same with me. Uh, you don't become a leader overnight. You don't have them installed and haha, now you're a leader. It doesn't work that way. You have to grow through incremental steps in your understanding. It's like, it's like love. It's like wisdom. Leadership is like those kinds of things that have to be grown over time and developed. And so leaders grow. Grow. They are not made. And I think that's a great way to end that. Okay. So, hey, listen, if you enjoyed this, um, I, I want you to stick around and go on to another episode because I'm going to talk about Drucker on management. I'm going to talk about Drucker's uh, wit and some really interesting ideas. Uh, and there are other ones. I've done Eisenhower and I've done uh, Jim Rohn. I have uh, others in the can that are ready to be developed that other great quotes. In fact, I even have a series that will be coming out shortly about uh, the greatest leadership quote. So I hope that that helps you become the kind of leader that you would want to follow. Mm -hmm.